I noticed that that has a very characteristic appearance with the orange margin around the back of the body. It's not actually an abdomen, but um, that orange marking and the dark um, scutal area with no ornamentation is a pretty clear indication that that is an adult deer tick. So if you chose tick number five, you are correct. That is a deer tick, uh, but there's others to be cited. So you cued in on the very characteristic picture. And if you look at pictures on the web, if you look at our ID cards that we share, that's sort of the canonical representation of the female deer tick. Um, going right to left, tick number four is also a deer tick. So if you identified, if you were one of the nine people that identified that deer tick, you would also be correct. Um, and as it turns out, number three and number two and number one are all in fact deer ticks. Um, there are different species, there's, excuse me, they're different stages. For example, tick number two is a larval tick, which can be indicated by the six legs. Uh, ticks number three and four, excuse me, one, three and four, are partially fed, so they've changed the shape, they've sh changed some of the pigmentation, but in fact, all of those ticks are deer ticks. All of those ticks were sent to us uh, for tick testing, and all were um, accurately identified as deer ticks, and just to be sure that the IDs are correct, we actually DNA type every specimen now as part of our procedure. So I just wanted to do that little exercise because often we're confident that we can identify tick species, but um, but we may uh, also have a little bit more, a uh, little bit further to go in terms of, of recognizing those. So one of the things we hope to do in the future, so now I'm back on the slideshow here, one of the things we hope to do in the future is we've collected close to 60,000 tick images, uh, images of, peop of ticks that have bitten people. And so what we'd like to do is be able to share those with you in a way that's, um, that you're able to peruse and hopefully uh, compare, or perhaps if we're lucky, we can get some uh, virtual, um, some AI software to recognize this, but to compare a tick that you might be confronted with, with um, known images so that you'll be able to better identify your tick. Um, so I just wanted to say that to sort of kick off this conversation. And then I'm going to focus now, sorry, I'm gonna focus now on the two ticks that, um, are the other primary human biting ticks, not the brown tick, but the American dog tick and the Lone Star ticks, which are two of the three uh, human biting ticks that we see here in the Northeast and throughout the United States. Now, it's not to say they're the only three species. There are other uh, ticks that are, uh, that are occasionally found on humans and on pets, but these are the predominant. These make up most of the tick bite encounters that people would see in the continental United States. There are woodchuck ticks, and there are brown ticks, and there are rabbit ticks, and there are many other species of ticks, some of which we virtually never see on people, um, although because our sample size is so large now, we will even see some of the very, very rare ones on people. So not too long ago, we identified a squirrel tick. Again, all these ticks were identified by DNA testing. Um, a squirrel tick, Ixodes marksi, was found on a human subject, but um, we hope soon to uh, to, to put all that aggregate data out and show you all those those real oddities, but really we're concerned with just these three species. And today we're going to focus on the two non-deer tick species, which we think, uh, which we know are of interest. I remind you that uh, the data I'm going to present to you today is actually part of our passive surveillance. So there's no boundaries to this. People send us ticks from all over the country, um, and what we think makes this valuable is that people are sending us ticks where they're encountering them. And that's a, an excellent way to be able to surveil where the ticks are and where the pathogens are that are associated with those tick species. So we are talking about three principal human biting ticks. Uh, the deer tick, we're not gonna go back over because we've discussed it previously, but we're gonna to talk about the dog tick in the center and the lone star tick on the right. And the reason that we are interested in ticks always is because they are associated with transmission of certain pathogens or certain diseases. We've covered off on the deer tick uh, uh, pathogen species. The list is shown there. Um, today, we're gonna address the lone star ticks and the dog ticks. But just as a forecast of that, I'll say 
the principal things that are of concern in dog ticks are tularemia, the agent being Francisella tularensis. This has been associated with, it's not only acquired by tick bites, uh, it can be acquired through other means, including in home. Uh, Rocky Mountain fever, which actually predates Lyme disease in terms of its description. In fact, the earliest NIH studies on uh, ticks and tick-borne diseases were focusing on this uh, constellation of, of pathogens that come under a broad heading of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I won't be able to go too much into the detail of it, but I'll just say that there are probably multiple pathogen species involved in there, um, many of which are very closely related, and sometimes it's very difficult to discern them. And that may be one of the reasons that um, that there's different reports on incidence of those. And I'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a moment. In the Lone Star Tick, we're talking predominantly about uh, ehrlichiosis. Uh, there is a little bit of confusion out there because as entomologists and microbiologists often want to do, the name was changed several years ago. At one point, anaplasmosis, all the way on the left hand of your screen, and ehrlichiosis were in the same genus of bacteria. Um, anaplasma was later changed from an ehrlichia to an anaplasma, but they, are, they do have some similarities um, in terms of the, the, the microbiological characteristics. But in Lone Star ticks, we see primarily Ehrlichia proper uh, associated with a diseases called Ehrlichiosis. There's also a condition referred to as Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness or a, a Southern Lyme-like illness that does not seem to be associated with Borrelia that cause Lyme disease. There was some speculation for some time that uh, Borrelia Lone Star Eye, another species of Borrelia, may be causing this rash, this um, southern tick associated rash illness or starry it now uh it, it's now appearing the emerging picture is that that doesn't seem to be the culprit uh the linkage between borrelia lone star i and that um configuration of disease or that set of symptoms and signs doesn't seem to be a hard one and so there's some speculation that maybe borrelia lone star i is not a pathogen or is not the pathogen causing that illness in people the one at the bottom, I've, I've put in a different font color because it's a, a unique beast altogether. The more I do outreach talks, the more I he hear people asking about this. So I, I guess in the, um, the, the popular press, it's becoming uh, of greater note. And that's specifically that there are reports of people being bitten by ticks. And then later, uh, as a result of that tick bite, uh, acquiring an allergy to red meat. Um, we collaborate with Dr. Scott Cummins in North Carolina that was the individual that identified this first and actually was one of the earliest cases was one of his colleagues. Um, and what I can say about it is there's still much to be learned. I think Dr. Cummins would say that. Um, it's often associated with Lone Star ticks, although now we think that perhaps not exclusively that tick species. It, it's an allergy that's created against a sugar moiety that's present in certain red meats. So the, the, um, your body is exposed to it during the tick bite. And then later when you're exposed to that same sugar upon um, eating, um, eating red meat, your body reacts in an in a inappropriate or an allergic reaction uh, causing this kind of allergy. It's not entirely clear or it has not been um, excluded the possibility that that, that um, sugar or that thing that's, that's inducing the, the immunity or the um, allergic reaction, whether it's endogenous to the tick, in other words, does the tick make it, make that product? Um, is it something that the tick acquired from a past blood meal? And or is it something that's manufactured by something living inside the tick? For example, one of these bacterial species, perhaps not even an otherwise a pathogen, but uh, there's still much to, be, much to be questioned there. I will say that our involvement with this is because of tick report, because we access uh, or, or we interface with uh, large numbers of people that have been bitten by Lone Star ticks and other ticks, we are, um, we're trying to leverage that to give those individuals an opportunity to participate in uh, some research projects that would allow them to test their exposures to figure out the incidents with which this disease happens, et cetera. But still many, many more questions to be answered. 
And uh, I hope Dr. Scott Cummins, uh, we're going to at some point bring Dr. Scott Cummins here to Laboratory Medical Zoology for a public talk so that um, he could speak to us more about what he's seeing. He's an MD, um, and he could talk about um, what he's seeing on the clinical side. So I'll set that for the moment. So um, this is a bit of a review for those of you that watched the webinars before, but I've emphasized the importance of these three components of, uh, of measuring the exposure or the risk to tick-borne diseases. And those are, first, one has to know the tick species because not all ticks are, all species are hazardous. Um, one has to know the duration of feeding of the tick because pathogen transmission takes time. We've spoken about that in the past. I'm also going to address that a little bit today when I talk about vector confidence and vectorial capacity. Uh, and lastly, there's this business of the infection rate, that not all ticks are infected. And so it is valuable to understand something about the infection status of a tick that you removed from yourself or a loved one or, or, or a pet. Before um, going into the infection status piece per se, I'd like to just present you with some of the data that we're seeing for uh, ticks that are submitted to us. Uh, this is, these are data going back 2017 to 2013. These are map data showing the distribution of ticks. These are exodes, Lone Star ticks, and Dermacenter ticks sent to us uh, to laboratory medical zoology for identification and testing. And if I can move, zoom in here, I'm sorry. If I zoom in, I can show you uh, the concentration of these ticks. And you'll notice that there are some overlaps in these distributions, but there is uh, some areas of the country where you have a distinctly greater probability of being bitten by one tick more than another. So just looking here from this view, you can see there's a lot more of the blue, which corresponds to Lone Star ticks in the southeastern United States, and a lot more red up here in the northeast red up here in the upper Midwest, and then a smattering of green throughout corresponding to the, to, the, uh, to the dog ticks. So again, address this point before, but this will perhaps emphasize it, that the exposure to different tick species is not universal throughout the country. So where you go, when you go there, will um, we'll sort of determine what ticks you may or may not be exposed to. And just to give you some idea, each of those is a is a real data point and a real uh, tick exposure. Let me pan over to here in New England and you can see we are located right about here in central Mass Western Massachusetts. If I zoom in, <laughs> if I zoom in, you can just get some idea of the density of these data points. And the red again, those are the Deer, sorry, the deer ticks, and so not the species we're focusing on today, but if you look, um, sorry, those little boxes keep popping up. If you look, you can see the distribution. There are some dog ticks throughout the range, and as well, there are lone star ticks that are starting to show up in the range. And this is really a new piece of history for us because lone star ticks would not have been here even 25 years ago when I was a graduate student in Boston. Um, and so they're really expanding their range. Um, in some places, for, for example, Long Island and these coastal areas, we may actually start to be, see, we may be getting to the point where we see more human biting lone star ticks than, than deer ticks. Um, let me turn off the exodes for a second and show you just the dog ticks and we'll pan back out to that big picture. So you see the distribution of dog ticks um, throughout the Northeast. And then if we look at just the Lone Star ticks, we can see it's similar, but slightly more southerly and more coastal in orientation. So this becomes a little more evident when I break on. So now I'm showing a different set of figures. So now all the dots you see in these map, irrespective of colors, are dog ticks. And if I add in years, this is what was found in 2013, the orange, 2014, the blue, and I'll just add successive years, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 
and then of course 2019, which we're not even halfway through yet. So there you see a difference of colors representing different years that ticks have been sent to us for testing from different geographic areas. Now what I want to emphasize about this is we started doing tick report, we started doing this passive surveillance in 2006 and have relied for most of that word of mouth. So what we're seeing is in terms of the expansion of that sampling of dog ticks really uh, pertains to um, to the word of mouth or the, the knowledge about our, the, the awareness about our program and not so much that dog ticks, we don't think dog ticks are appreciably changing their, their range. And if I just cut everything out except the first year of our data, and the most recent full year, you can sort of see that, that what we're really seeing is more, so the orange is 2013, the blue is 2018. We're just seeing more ticks from some of the same areas and same ranges, not a big difference in the range of dog ticks. Now, you might imagine that in Lone Star ticks, now I've switched over to the other, to Lone Star ticks, we see a slightly different pattern. So I'm gonna walk through that same successive year of, of reporting. So here's 2013. And if you're wondering why I'm not including data back to 2006, there's two reasons for that. One is um, we have less data prior to 2012. Uh, and also this particular program only takes 25,000 data points. So I, I just selected back to the, the last 25,000 ticks and this is what it is. So 2013, here you see the distribution of Lone Star ticks. Already by that point, we had started to see an emergence of Lone Star ticks in uh, places like Long Island, rare occasions on, on uh, coastal, Mass in coastal Massachusetts and then northern New England. But by and large, this was known to be at that time a tick of the southeastern United States. 2014, now again, there's that same pattern of uh, people become more aware of our service, so we're getting a more broad uh, sampling, but we think it goes beyond that in that uh, it wasn't just knowledge of our sampling that led to these uh, more northward reports of the Lone Star Tick and greater abundances of Lone Star Ticks throughout Massachusetts. In other words, this is a real invasion uh, based on anecdote and the data at present that these Lone Star Ticks just weren't here uh, as I say, 10 years ago, and they're really moving in and they're becoming established. Entomologists will tell you that documenting established populations of amblyomma ticks or of Lone Star ticks really requires seeing all three stages and over a period of time. We agree with that strict definition. Um, in this case, we're only seeing sort of pinpoints of people's exposures. Uh, and nonetheless, we think this is reflective of, in many instances, uh, establishment of this tick in these areas. So I'll continue this series. Here's 2016 added in, 2017, 2018, and then of course the latter part of 2019. So at that point, there's so many colors, it's a little bit hard to discern. So let me again, just pick the most recent completed year. And the first year for this data shown, and here you see a pattern that's different from Derma Center. So rather than more of the same, there's clearly a, a, a real expansion uh, just in this five-year period, uh, both northward and um, sort of um, westward in the, in the upper Midwest. So Lone Star ticks are expanding their range. They are, uh, in some cases, I can zoom in here to Long Island, we're seeing more ticks from excuse me, more Lone Star ticks here from Long Island than we're seeing deer ticks. So many people are horrified to think about that. So one of the factors that differentiates Lone Star ticks from deer ticks is Lone Star ticks are very aggressive biters. So it's often said that a, a Lone Star tick will travel a distance to bite you, whereas a deer tick is a questing tick that lies back and wait. And so that rightfully so makes people very nervous about those ticks. What I'm, what I'm about to tell you though, is that there could be a, an upside to this, a glass half full view of this, specifically that Lone Star ticks are less often associated with pathogen transmission, not zero 
uh, probability, but they have a lower incidence. Nothing comes to the level of, of infection that we see in uh, deer ticks with, uh, with respect to the causative agent of Lyme disease. So if these ticks are really establishing and becoming more common than deer ticks, uh, there might be an upside to that and that there might actually be less associated disease, if not more of just of a nu nuisance kind of tick. Okay, thank you for uh, bearing with my technical stuff. So I'm gonna now go back to the, to the slideshow because what I really wanted to focus on next was talking about the infection status. So everything I shared with you in those last slides was just showing you the distribution of the tick species as we've seen them in the past several years. It's also not broken down by, by stage, something else that we could show in a, longer, in a longer presentation. What I want to present to you now is, um, I have to move something so I can see my own slide here. Um, I want to show you the, uh, the reported incidence of different pathogens. So I've abbreviated these just so we could fit them on a single page. So Borrelia burgdorferi, Babesia microti, Anaplasma phagocytophilum are the three principal pathogens associated with deer ticks. And this is deer tick. I'm sorry I didn't write the common name here. Um, so again, across all adults and female, adult females and males and nymphal ticks, we see about 32% of the 30,000 ticks that we've tested are infected with that pathogen. Bear that number in mind because it's going to be the biggest number on this table. Babesia microti, the malaria-like pathogen, or anaplasma phagocytophilum, the agent that infects our immune cells, they are somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six percent in this large series of, sorry, that number should also be um, about 30,900. So a large number, uh, a fairly large percentage of these. And then I point out that there's a whole bunch of pathogens that um, are not present in in deer ticks, including Borrelia lone star eye, which we think is specific to, uh, to the lone star ticks, Rickettsia rickettsii, Rickettsia philippi, and Rickettsia parkeri. These are the part of that constellation of Rocky Mountain spotted fever agents, uh, Francisella tularensis, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, and this is Bartonella hensile. And way over here at the right is the one viral representative here, which is Powassan virus. Um, and you can see we've seen about um, less than half a percent infection rate um, among the 30,000 ticks that have been tested for Powassan virus. We're up to about 15 positives now. Um, 15 positive people, positive ticks that have fed on people. And what I am happy to report is we've done uh, follow-ups, just checked on these folks because we want to explain to them that their, their tick test is not a diagnosis. And we're uh, happy to report back that none of those people have been sy symptomatic. So it may be that lots of it may be that a certain number of people are getting exposed to that pathogen and not getting sick. So that also could be a, a positive story for for another day. I want to just focus for a moment just on these zeros. So you notice that this tick is not associated with these pathogens, and for that reason, many less ticks get tested for it. So while we received some 30,000 ticks as shown here, we only tested a couple thousand because these were instances where people very specifically asked us for these additional tests. They wanted us to test their uh, Exodes tick, their deer tick, for a very rare uh, pathogen called Francisella. And then the 2,000 we looked at, 0% of them were, uh, were infected. Let's go to another, to the next tick species. Here's the Lone Star Tick. Again, sorry for not doing the, 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 the general name, the common name. A um, Couple things to draw from here. So first, Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease in the, my apologies, these, the, the numbers on the bottom here are incorrect. We actually test every tick. So this number should be closer to 30,000. Uh, we, we test every tick for Borrelia burgdorferi for the Lyme disease pathogen, and every one of these ticks was negative. So some 30, close to 31,000 ticks were negative for, for amblyoma. I'll be sure that this slide gets corrected um, on the, in, the, um, in the future presentation, but this number should be about 30,000. So lots and lots of ticks, no Lyme disease. I want you to remember that because 
I'm going to talk about some other findings where people have reported instances of Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme disease in Lone Star ticks, and that really goes against the general consensus that, the, that Lone Star ticks aren't associated with Lyme disease, nor are they associated with Babesia microti, which is really an Exodes tick thing, it really belongs in deer ticks. Anaplasma phagocytophilum, there is a low infection rate of uh, what we call anaplasma phagocytophilum in those in the 4,600 ticks that we've tested. It's a remarkably low number. We suspect, and when I say suspect, I mean we have to go back and confirm this through genetic identification, but we suspect this is actually a different strain or species of anaplasma that differs from that which is typically found in the deer tick. So it may represent a new emerging uh, pathogen line or transmission cycle associated with Lone Star ticks. So this remains a, an interesting um, observation. Nonetheless, it's, it's still very, very uh, um, rare. Likewise, the one that I told you about before, Borrelia Lone Star Eye, it also occurs at about 1%, although not thought to be a pathogen. Um, rickettsias, the three rickettsia species, as in the deer ticks, we find 0% infection rate. Um, and Francisella tularensis, we find a very low infection rate. This is, I think, one or two out of 4,600. Uh, the next most common pathogen in this species is, um, is um, Ehrlich Ehrlichia chaffiensis. So I don't want to get too lost in the, in the, the numbers here, but I'd like you to, appreciate, to understand that the rates of infection with the Lone Star specific ticks in Lone Stars are much, much smaller than the rates of infection of, of deer tick pathogens in deer ticks. So when you compare this 32% to this 1.15 or close to 1%, you can see that deer ticks still pose a much more serious risk, much higher percentage of exposing you to hazards that lie within them. And just to complete this, let me now show you the data for dog ticks which are lower still in incidence of reported illnesses. So you notice most of these cases are zero percent, no, most of these instances are zero percent. There is a rare instance of Francisella tularensis. Um, I should say at this point that in this case, the rare cases of Francisella we've seen, um, I think we're up to four or five now, two of those were from a tick from a single child in um, on the Idaho-Washington border that was very, very sick, and the parents were astutely able to send us the tick and report back to the doctor the results that that, that tick was uh, sick, was uh, infected with Francisella, were able to uh, treat the child, and the ch child got better. So while these can be very, very rare, it's, they should not be regarded as, as not dangerous because they are still um, potentially very dangerous pathogens, albeit very, very rare. I'd like again to focus on the fact that Dog ticks quite simply are not associated with Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme disease, Babesia microti, rarely associated again with some kind of anaplasma, which also might be a, a different kind of species, or it could be just incidental occurrence of this. I'm going to talk a moment about uh, vector competence so that you get some idea of um, what else could be going on here. So these are the summary, summary of our data. Um, they're publicly available data. I've just summarized them here in a, in a way that helps us to talk about it. Um, but you can always go to tickreport.com and you can look at these data, both for your geographic region. Um, we've broken it down now by state and zip code. We hope soon to be able to do so for, uh, for county as well. But these data are readily available to you and we're ready to stand by them and tell you uh, exactly what they mean. <clears throat> so, look, be, because there's a lot of concern about certain pathogens, you hear a lot in the press or uh, we see a lot on social media about pathogens like Bartonella pensilae and Rickettsia rickettsii, um, and then some of the other ones that are not so rare but not often associated with pathogenesis here in, in New England. For example, most of the Lone Star ticks that we see in New England we've not seen Ehrlichia chaffiensis. So while we think the ticks are established here, we don't think that necessarily the disease transmission cycle is established here because perhaps it's, there's just, the reservoirs are here, but there's just not an infection rate to, to maintain an endemic cycle. But because people have focused so much on Bartonella and Rickettsia, and yet 
we were only te uh, testing a small percentage of the ticks that we received because we basically offer that tick testing service as a you know an additional additional service as an option, and not many people elected for it elected it. We thought it wise to go back and look at a retrospective survey of the ticks that we had and look at a larger series to see if that we could find evidence of Bartonella or Rickettsia rickettsii e in our in our uh, tick database. So to do this, we took the, um, so this was back in 2014, we've now have almost three times this number of ticks, two and a half anyway. Um, we took the 23, almost 24,000 ticks that we had in our database and we pooled the DNA samples from those. So the DNA is the stuff that we use to, for, for, to conduct our testing. So we produced 2,000 or 23,951 uh, tick samples into about 450 pools, just so that it was a more manageable estimate because we had no um, had little means to, to to do a large series of 24,000. And then we tested each of these 450 pools to see if we could find any of these needles in these particular haystacks. And what we found what, was that among those 24,000 ticks, all were negative for Bartonella hensley and Rickettsia rickettsii. Okay. So all of the ticks that were sent to us, human biting ticks, we found no evidence of either of these two pathogens. And maybe that's just the full stop and I'll, I'll come to um, the next slide, which I, the reason I'm taking a point of this, so this is a, a figure which I pulled down from a, a lab in Pennsylvania that, that's conducting tick testing as well. Um, they're, they're, they seem to be a service lab. I don't know that they have anyone on their staff or they have a faculty oversight. Or I, I'm really not sure what they do or um, what methodologies they're, they're, they're using, but they are finding results that stand in contrast to what we find and what is found in the literature um, for people that have done active surveillance that uh, mirrors the kind of passive surveillance we're, we're doing. So among other things, they find a, a an astonishingly high positivity rate for um, pathogens in deer ticks. So 89% was higher than anything we've seen. Uh, likewise for lone star ticks and derm center ticks, uh, just remarkably uh, high numbers of infectivity. Now, again, without knowing precisely what's going on in that testing or what kind of testing they're doing or what kind of controls they have, uh, no, over, no, no uh, compliance oversight, or reporting out of, out of their results, no peer review. Uh, we're left to just wonder what this means, but it stands in, in stark, stark contrast to what we're seeing. Um, and I think you know there, there should be more explanation of what's what's going on here rather than just posting on a web page. Other uh, take homes are they find about 44%. So you remember, if you could go back to the slide, we've looked at now 24,000 ticks. Um, and we find 0% infection with Bartonella. These, uh, this group is finding 44%. They're finding Lyme Borrelia in both deer ticks, uh, sorry, in dog ticks and lone star ticks. Again, we've, we don't find that. Um, there was a paper published a few years ago, a peer-reviewed paper that was a summary, a, a meta-analysis of many different studies. We actually contributed some of our data to that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ellen Stromdale of um, now retired, but formerly of the U.S. Army, had compiled all these data, and there's just no evidence for Borrelia being in Lone Star ticks. So again, how the Pennsylvania group is coming up with these numbers, um, we, we just can't, we, we, we're not sure how to interpret that, but we would exercise caution in interpreting individual results from a group that's reporting um, population data of this kind. So let me just speculate for a moment what it is that could lead to a differential, the kinds of data that the that laboratories like the one I just reported, or from what we see in tick report, or between any two studies, why there might be a difference in those kinds of data. And it really pertains to the way that we go about testing ticks and or people for presence or absence of pathogens. And so what I'd like to just do is not, um, just give a general overview of what we're talking about. So 
we're concerned here, right, about ticks, which are the vectors that are going to transmit pathogens. And then, of course, we're concerned about people because we, we want to know who's getting infected and who's getting ill. And we want to be able to detect infection where it exists. And so there are basically two ways that we can do this. One is we can look for the DNA, or in the case of certain viruses, the RNA of those pathogens. So shown here are Borrelia. These little squiggly lines are actually the Borrelia, the Lyme disease spirochetes, the bacteria that don't look like what you usually think of bacteria, but they are spirochetes. Each of those spirochetes has a DNA molecule, a DNA molecule that tells that spirochete how to make more spirochetes. Just like you have DNA that um, is used to make more of us. And because every one of these has DNA, they turn out, it turns out to be a very, very good detection, a very good um, means of identifying where these things occur. Um, but it's not the only means. The other means we can utilize is actually to look at the proteins. And I'll show you just a cartoon of that in a, a moment. But from biology class, you may remember that DNA encodes proteins. And so there's a relationship between these two pieces. But when one is looking for protein, One's not looking for the blueprints of the animal, of the creature. One's looking for the um, the actual the the structure of the of the surface of that of that creature. And so another way we can detect pathogens other than DNA or RNA is we can look for proteins, or very specifically for antigens, which are a portion of the protein which interacts with antibodies. The, third player here, shown by the third color. And antibodies are things that are produced by us. Ticks don't produce these. Antibodies are things that are produced by uh, humans, mice, dogs, cats, etc. And they're very specific and very able, very um, targeted to recognizing antigens or per certain portions of protein. Uh, and then in most cases, trying to do something about the presence of them. They can induce other responses in the host that will kill those bacteria. But basically, this is one way that we can look for infection in both ticks and humans is by looking for the presence of antigen, utilizing antibodies as the signal molecule or the signaling recognition piece to, uh, to test. So those are, that's what's available to us. We can look at DNA or we can look at protein. So here up in the upper right-hand corner, I've just reminded you that DNA encodes RNA, which is going to translate to a protein. So there's a relationship between these three things that's important to bear in mind. Um, but when we think about these as in terms of targets of protection, either the DNA or the protein ends of things, the nucleic acids or the antigen pieces, we can look at particular factors that make uh, some of these things strong or weak. So in terms of looking for nucleic acids, detecting pathogens based on nucleic acid, um, one of the things we can say is that, they're more, that the DNA tend to be more variable than protein because there can be changes in these DNA molecules that don't manifest into changes in the protein. And it's just a, probably not important for us to talk about the Watson, big, uh, Watson Crick aspects of this, but trust us that there's some differences here that might not manifest here. So just qualitatively, we can say that there's more variation in nucleic acids than there are in proteins. And why is that useful? It means that if there's more variation, it's possible to, it's more possible to discern different species or different strains because there's more stuff to tell them apart, um, just sort of put simply. Another aspect of nucleic acids is that DNA in particular is a very stable molecule. So you know from Discovery's channel and other places that we can go back to uh, tens of thousands of years of, of dead specimens, humans in the Alps or uh, woolly mammoths from tar pits or wherever they come from, and you can still pull DNA. The DNA remains stable for that length of period. And because it's stable, it serves as a very good detection target. It doesn't go away. It's not easily uh, destroyed by uh, factors to which the ticks may be exposed or the humans may be exposed. And so um, the fact that it's a, a very stable molecule, far more stable than proteins, makes it valuable as a target. Uh, the corresponding RNA is, is actually quite low in stability. It doesn't, 
it's quite ephemeral. It disappears relatively quickly. It's much lower than protein. And I mention this because all RNA testing is based on, uh, or excuse me, all virus testing is based on RNAs because in the case of all RNA viruses, they lack DNA. So DNA would not be a target for those. And if you have ever tested a tick through us um, for a Powassan virus, you'll notice that we start every specimen by testing whether we can pull RNA out of the tick before we bother even trying to test uh, for Powassan virus. Because it turns out, because of that stability, about 80% of our ticks are testable. About 20%, by the time we get them, get the tick, its RNA is so degraded that we'd never be able to, tell, to detect the Powassan virus in that. So we have that internal control, that quality control for Powassan testing. We do a similar test, similar quality control for DNA. It just turns out that rarely is the DNA degraded. And the only real way that DNA degraded gets degraded is, 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 is if it's exposed to strong bases like bleaches, which are rel relatively uncommon. Um, another aspect of the, the utility of looking at DNA as a target is that the, tar the detection method itself um, called PCR or polymerase chain reaction involves an exponential ampli amplification step. So even if you have a vanishingly small amount of material and think about the woolly mammoth, so it turns out the woolly mammoth, there's not a lot of DNA left in that specimen. It's just that because the DNA is present in a low amount and we're able to amplify it and detect that very low amount, it makes it a very, very good uh, tar target for, uh, for detection. And then the last thing I'd say about nucleic acids as targets for detection of pathogens is that the cross-reactivity is very, very low, close to 0%. And what I mean by that is if you design a test properly to detect Lyme disease, it will not accidentally detect anaplasma or Babesia or anything else because it's based on the nucleotide sequences, the DNA sequences, which are not only unique to species, but in some cases can be unique to individuals, for example, as we know in humans. So the whole um, human genoming, uh, private human genome sequencing that people are engaging in now is built on this principle that even among identical twins, the DNA is not identical. So it's almost impossible to get cross-reactivity in a properly designed DNA assay. And so that makes them very, very robust. So switching to the other side, so this is, I should say, this is done almost ex entirely, this, this is exactly what we do when we test ticks. We look for nucleic acid. Um, and we do it because we can grind up the whole tick and we can extract the whole bits of DNA from it. And then we can test that whole sample for the presence absence of those DNA molecules. Um, people often ask us, well, why don't we do this for people? Well, the simple answer is we can't grind up whole people. We wouldn't want to grind up old people. We wouldn't want to extract all the nucleic acid from an individual. So it's not only not practical, it's just not possible. And so what's possible to do uh, in ticks is not, cannot be done easily in humans. Now you can take certain tissues. For example, you can take tissue biopsies or blood samples. And in some cases, these very powerful techniques will detect the presence or absence of those nucleic acids in those samples. But because of the nature of Lyme disease in particular, which is it hides out, um, it's usually not, we're usually not able to sample the, uh, the DNA itself, even if we could, even though we have the ability to detect it, we can't get the right sample. Switching to the other side, uh, and then just quickly, because this is more on the, on the health, on the um, medicine side, uh, most of the tests that test pathogens in people are targeting proteins or antigens. So a factor of proteins is that they're less variable than antigens, uh, sorry, than, than nucleic acids. And so they tend to be less able to discern different strains of bacteria, in some cases, different species. And there is um, correspondingly, if you skip all the way down to the bottom of that list, there's a greater likelihood of cross-reactivity because things aren't as variable. So the features of one bacteria may not have changed appreciably or may cross-react with other antibodies in a way that we wouldn't see when we use a DNA-targeted assay. So that's one downside, one thing that leads to, to problems in uh, diagnosing or detecting the presence of pathogens. And it's, it's simply the, the very simple reason that we wouldn't use those kinds of approaches on ticks because we're not, 
we're not limited in that way. Um, I'd also emphasize that the uh, proteins themselves can be detected either directly or indirectly. So if we were going to look for protein in ticks, we would use a direct antibody approach. We'd use antibodies to look for the antigens or the proteins. Um, but most of the testing that's done in people are, an, are indirect approaches, where basically you're looking to see if you have antibodies that recognize that particular antigen. And then the inference is if you have antibodies, then you must have been exposed at some point to that antigen or that protein, and hence to that, that bacterium. So you can see they're very different approaches, whereas indirect testing of human subjects is looking for a, basically a history of exposure to a protein. Our methodology is looking at uh, detection of DNA in situ as it exists in that, in that organism. So they're very different, very different testing schemes. So before I go to vector competence, I just, one of the reasons I think it's possible for two labs or three labs or two individuals to, to do um, these detection methods and come up with different results is that if one does not take care to understand the level of variation that, that is present in the DNA molecules or the level of variation that's present in the protein molecules, or if um, one does not eliminate potential cross-reactivity associated with different paths. So you can get cross-reactivity in poorly designed DNA assays. Um, and that just requires that, that one uh, optimize and validate these things. And so if tests have not been validated and don't have complete sets of controls, they're likely to lead to very spurious results. And my suspicion is that's largely what we're seeing from certain labs that are reporting these aberrant instances of, of pathogens. And no, I, I don't want to uh, take too much issue with this, but I would say that there does seem to be a phenomenon among, among folks that, that they often seem like they're looking for positives. So they're, they're, they're anticipating that, 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 that something's there and then they're hoping for a laboratory that can find that positive result. Um, I would just suggest that that's probably not the best scientific, that's not the way science works at its best, that one is much better uh, having a rigorous independent um, set of, 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 of design and assays and then to trust the results because you know a priori that the, that the tests are designed properly. I think another thing that is going on here in people's minds is um, pertains to this business of vector competence and something called vectorial capacity. So vector competence is the ability of an arthropod to transmit a given pathogen. So I show here a picture of a tick and a mosquito. And what I'd like to emphasize is that the act of picking up a pathogen from blood, keeping it in your, in your gut for a while, speaking as an arthropod, and then depositing that into a, the bloodstream of another individual, is not a simple trick. It requires lots of adaptation of the pathogen of the bacterium. It, it, it requires in some cases extreme accommodation of the hostile environment of the arthropod. And it also it requires that the, the host somehow be uh, amenable to that whole process taking place. And by amenable, I mean not willingly, but uh, have conditions such that the feeding can take place, et cetera, et cetera. And none of those are, I say, easy tricks because all of them require high degrees of adaptation and um, genetic architecture is involved. Uh, very often there's different structures. And so not all arthropods can be said to be vectors of all pathogens. And as corollaries to that, we know that if a person is infected with a particular bloodborne pathogen, so let's use malaria as an example, which could be transmitted, which is transmitted exclusively by mosquitoes. If a mosquito or a tick feeds on that person, there's a possibility, pretty good possibility, that that other species of mosquito or that species of tick will pick up the parasite when it takes the blood up. But unless it's a competent reservoir, and the majority of them are not specific for that pathogen, it will kill the pathogens because 
uh, ticks and mosquitoes like us are susceptible to infections of their own. And so they have their own immune systems that are meant to protect them against those things. They also may lack the key elements inside themselves that allow the parasite or the pathogens to move around. And so um, finding, uh, sorry, presence of a, of a pathogen in a tick that just fed is not documentation that it's a competent vector. Uh, competence really requires demonstrating, and all this has to be done in a laboratory, that you can take an infected mammal, feed a tick on it, and then infect another mammal. That's really what has to take place for, to, to establish vector competence. And there are lots of papers out there, for Lyme disease in particular, that report um, unusual transmission cycles that are quite mistakenly identifying presence or absence of the pathogen in that vector as evidence of competence. And that's simply not the case. It requires much more biological investigation to determine which species are associated with which uh, pathogens. Um, and that's been done extensively for the, for the pathogens I've spoken about thus far and for the species of ticks I've, been, I've spoken about thus far. So in many ways, our passive surveillance just uh, corroborates what's been shown through these uh, laboratory studies of competence. Um, and there's plenty of pathogen transmission in Lyme disease in particular without having to invoke uh, special, special pleading of um, instances of, of mosquito transmission or fleet, sand fleas or anything else. Um, I already showed this slide once before, but it just gives you a little cartoon showing uh, as a tick feeds and creates this feeding lesion down at the bottom and we look at a cutaway at the gut, we know that it's not simply a, uh, a syringe needle, the in and the out of this process, what's going into the tick and what's coming out of the tick come through different organs. And these organs are separated by their own membranes that have to be traversed by the pathogens. And so the pathogens have to evolve the ability to do this. And that usually requires a high degree of specialization uh, with an associated uh, incompetent reservoir. Not just any tick can do this. Um, not, any, not any bacteria can do this. It requires bacteria and ticks that have adapted a suitable set of mechanisms that allow this transmission to take place. The last thing I'll say is just uh, to contrast uh, vector, vector competence with something called vectorial capacity. It's so maybe getting a little bit down into the weeds, but I just wanted to say that it's possible in a laboratory to find a tick which is a competent vector for a given pathogen. That is, you can do the experiment I just discussed. Take an infected mammal, feed a tick on it, take that tick and at some time later feed it on an uninfected mammal and lo and behold establish uh, infection in that uninfected animal. That tick would be said to be vector competent. However, if that tick never encounters that mammal in the wild because of differences in seasonality, or it just refuses to eat on that, that host in a, in a natural setting, or it has a life cycle that means that it's feeding at an active time when, when the mammal is not present, for example, migrating birds, then we would say it has very, very low vectorial capacity. So vector competence is something we can measure in the laboratory. Vectorial capacity is something that has to be measured in the field. Vectorial capacity is the ability of a competent vector to actually drive transmission of these cycles in the wild. So they're very, very different things. Um, and just sort of emphasize the notion that there's another level of filtering that require, that's required for a tick to truly be a highly uh, vectorial, uh, have a high vectorial capacity for any given pathogen. And in the case of Lyme disease and the ticks that are the pathogens associated with deer ticks, they've crossed that bar. They have um, established that competency. They have established that high vectorial capacity. Um, not so for deer ticks and dog ticks, no, sorry, dog ticks and lone star ticks. Um, and their association with the, the pathogens that are really pathogens uh, transmitted by deer ticks. So um, I did leave a second slide. Um, 
maybe we go back to there for the moment. Um, I'm happy to, to answer your questions. One of the easiest way for us to see the questions is if you go back to um, here, and I go to the next slide. We would be grateful if you wanted to post your questions here and we will answer them either offline or in, in coming webinars. Our next webinar is until the fall, um, but I remind you that uh, we're always here and able to take uh, questions either by email or most easy if you go to tickreport.com and enter on our chat line. You can ask questions about things I, I, talk, I spoke about today, about things I've spoken about in past webinars, about things I didn't speak about today. Um, we recognize the importance of having that real-time interface um, and, and, and support in that regard. And I also wanted to tell you that um, I'm going to be reprising these kinds of this kind of information at a talk that we'll be having at the new Newton campus of UMass at the former um, Mount Ida College campus. Um, so we'll be there on the 14th of May, we being Tick Report. I'll be talking about uh, tick report and tick-borne diseases. I'll be joined by uh, uh, Larry Dapsis from the Cape Cod Extension. He's an entomologist there. He's an amazing personality that will tell you about uh, ticks and tick-borne diseases, tick protection. Um, worked with Larry extensively in the past, and we, we have a great uh, professional relationship. Um, and uh, I think you'll enjoy hearing his perspective on ticks. We'll also be joined by Dr. Catherine Brown, who is the uh, Massachusetts State Epidemiologist. She'll tell you more about uh, human surveillance. So it should be a very nice evening. Um, we'll have some light refreshments, coffee and cookies, and I think it's actually muffins. Uh, and um, this is an opportunity to reach out to the public and to meet some of you maybe face to face. I have been to a couple of talks recently and I, I've met people um, that listen to the webinars. I look forward to meeting more of you. So on the 14th of May, if you're free, uh, please consider coming to this. You can find more information on our webpage or email us at infoticreport.com. Um, we hope to see you there. And we're hoping this will be uh, the first step in establishing a presence for uh, the Laboratory of Medical Zoology at that campus so that we're in Boston uh, and able to give more support where uh, where this is, the, the need is high. This is not a a disease that's left to the woodlands. It's a disease of suburban areas. And so we're hoping to be able to support people inside 128 with information and uh, quality tick testing. The last slide is just to remind you that the uh, uh, to register for the next webinar, which is this fall. I'm sorry, this is a bare bones slide, but you can find the link there to that webinar, uh, which I think is in October 2019. Um, and as always, it will be um, on the, uh, I guess, the second Wednesday of that month. So, so with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. I'll look to the Mentimeter page for your questions if you wish to post them there. Um, and if you didn't, if you lost that uh, that link, I'll put it back up here. So I'll close with um, with that image, and we'll see you all. If not. In, in Newton, then we'll see you all the next fall in the webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rich. Uh, it's been uh, great to have you on the last four webinars. And folks, again, remember to register for the webinar in October. And before you sign off, please remember to uh, complete that survey. And uh, we thank you for participating. And uh, we'll See you in October. And again, we are out of time, so Dr. Rich was not able to answer the questions, but um, uh, email him or go to the, the, the Mentimeter and, and put in your questions, and he will be happy to answer those. Again, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you in October.